excited to teach class this morning. Now, we've got almost nine grandchildren. Yeah, almost nine grandchildren. You know, um, uh, we've got, uh, I got an, a, a, an email, a text from Gracie with, uh, she's got three of them. Uh, under the age of three, you know, because she's got the twin girls. She and her husband are playing zone defense from here on out, Coach. There's no man-to-man. It's gone. <laughs> They're outnumbered. But uh, um, they are at an age where John Henry, at least, is starting to learn nursery rhymes. Now, nursery rhymes are in these marvelous little books that have Mother Goose. And I, I grew up with nursery rhymes, uh, not so much the little books, but dad would tell them to us. Mom would tell them to us. If mom told them to us, they were told properly. If dad told them to us, they would be more along the lines of little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider and sat down beside her. And she beat the heck out of him with the spoon. <laughs> Nursery rhymes are wonderful ways for children to memorize things. They're lackadaisical and funny. But if you ever get into the history of nursery rhymes, there's some fascinating history. Now, a lot of this history has been cobbled together, so I'm not sure how reliable all of it is, having looked at it. But if you look, for example, at Pop Goes the Weasel, the way it was first published as we go back hundreds of years was along the lines of half a pound of tuppenny rice, half a pound of treacle. That's the way the money goes. Pop Goes the Weasel. The second verse. Up and down the city road, in and out the eagle. That's the way the money goes. Pop goes the weasel. Now, I grew up saying it a little bit differently, but I remember Pop goes the weasel. That was really funny and fun to say. What I didn't understand is that this is a, a type of London slang, Cockney slang. And pop means to pawn something. And weasel was... Uh, um, Cockney slang for weasel and stoat was, was your coat. Weasel and stoats are animals, but it rhymes with coat, and Cockney slang did a lot of rhyming. And so the idea was you've got to pay half a pound for two penny rice, or two pence, I guess is what they would have called it, half a pound for treacle, which is like syrup, and that's where your money goes. Now you've got to hawk your jacket to be able to pay for it. Or up and down the city road, in and out the eagle. The eagle was a pub. That's the way the money goes. Pop goes the weasel. You gotta go mortgage your coat off to get pay your ta bar tab. You know, if you were reading the book, The Secret History of Nursery Rhymes, Ring Around the Rosie, it goes ring a ring of rosies in the oldest versions we have. Pocket full of posies, ash to shoe, ash to shoe, we all fall down. Later it became ashes, ashes, we all fall down. But that seems to be the consensus of scholars to have grown out of the uh, bubonic plague outbreak in London in 1665. And the ring of ring of rosies were the little rose rings from the plague that you get on your body. And a to shoe is the sneezing that sound. That was a sneezing sound. We say a chew, but they said a chew, a chew, because the sneezing came with it. We all fall down, half the population dies. Now, don't ruin your grandkids and your kids with that. <laughs> I mean, don't ring around the rosies. Yeah, y'all go out there and sing the bubonic plague song about everybody dying. All to say that when you, you can read these things, you can enjoy these things, but context truly does matter. And, and you, can, you can read them and enjoy them, but if you get it in context, it can help um, 
sharpen your focus and also give you greater truth, give you greater insight. And that's not only true with nursery rhymes, that's true with important things. It's true with the Bible. And so I want to look at the Gospel of Matthew with you today, but we're going to make three stops along the road as we go through it. The first stop, I want to explore the context of Matthew as a Gospel. And then after we explore the context of Matthew as a Gospel, I want to consider some passages where that context gives those passages extra meaning. And then we'll have our points for home and we'll talk about why any of this makes any difference to us other than academic curiosity. All right? So that's our roadmap. Let's start exploring the context. The context, here is a map of the Roman Empire at it, the height of its expansion. So 115, 120 A.D. The height of its expansion. You've got Israel down here, Judea. You've got Syria, Cilicia, Lycia, Asia, Galatia. Galatia, actually southern Galatia comes down into this area. You've got Macedonia. You know that Paul has taken the gospel message throughout this entire swath here. You also have people from Rome that Paul's written to. You've got the gospel here all in the life of Paul. But let's talk about it and put a timeline up to go with this. If Christ dies around 33 AD, it's reasonable to say that Paul is called on the Damascus Road probably 33, 34 AD. When scholars put a date that's a C period, C period 33 would be the way a scholar would write it. C is from the Latin kirka. And it means we get the word circa from it, about. So about 33, 34 A.D., Paul gets his call on the Damascus Road. Now Paul does his mission work, and, and so does the rest of the church. And we read about that in the book of Acts, and we can read about it in church history. And around 65 A.D., Paul and Peter die as martyrs in Rome. Church history is pretty solid on that. So Nero is the emperor, they die in Rome. Now, during that period of time, the Gospels are written. At least Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and you think, you know, if I had been doing the Bible, if God had called me and said, Mark, I'm putting you in charge of the Bible, I want you to get this thing written down and buttoned up. The first thing I'd have done is I'd have said, okay, Jesus has ascended to heaven. Let's get all of this stuff down fresh right now. I want all of you in one room, and we're not leaving until we got the story and we got it all written out. Then we're going to publish it. And then when Paul has his Damascus Road experience, we're going to give him a copy. And then he's going to have it, and he's going to take it out, and we're going to have him make Xeroxes of it and hand it out on the road. He's going to be our first Gideon Bible passer-outer. Okay. Every hotel room in which he stays, he's leaving a Gideon's Bible right there. And I'd have laid it out that way. That's not the way God did it. God unfolded Scripture through the inspiration of his Spirit and we can talk about how that comes about at another time because Jesus laid it out real clearly in the Gospel of John how he would do that. He explained that after he left, he would send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would remind the apostles of all of the things that they needed to be reminded of. That the Holy Spirit through the apostles would bear witness to Christ and they do that through their apostolic writings or those that are apostolically anointed. And so God says, Jesus says he's going to work through the apostles to produce scripture. And over time, that is what's done. But at first, the early church thinks Jesus is probably coming back in a couple of weeks. They don't really understand fully that he's going to be gone for a while. 
And that's, you know, they're, they're selling everything they've got and they're, they're holding it in common and, and they're set up for Jesus to come back in a week or two. I mean, seriously, if Jesus is coming back next week, do you really need to go buy a new car today? If Jesus is coming back next week, isn't there a lot you could be doing between now and next week when he comes back? And this was the mentality of the early church, and it was a good mentality because it got that church going zero to 60 really fast before the church began to understand that that wouldn't be the case. This is why Simon Gathercole's lecture coming up at the library is an important one. Trying to look to see if Paul, at least initially, might have thought the return of Christ was any moment. And so the, the church, I, you don't need to write the gospel for a further generation when all of the apostles are around to tell you what happened. You lived in an oral culture anyway, where most re re relating of events was done orally. There wasn't mass publications of books. Amazon.com did not yet exist. Neither did Barnes & Noble. And so you've got generally oral retelling of these stories, but as it becomes apparent Jesus is not immediately coming back, and for other reasons I'm sure, there became a need for a written record as the church is expanding and growing. A written record not only in the sense of Paul's letters, but a written record of the gospel story of Jesus. His death, burial, and resurrection. Written by authentic people who knew about it. And so within this framework of this time period here, most scholars believe that Mark was written first as a full gospel. And I think that's probably a fair assumption. I think most scholars recognize that Matthew was written second. There are a good number of scholars, and I, I agree with this set of scholars, that believe that Matthew was a note taker. And Matthew would have taken notes of a lot of the teachings of Jesus. He was a tax collector, and they were note takers. And so he would have had those notes, probably in the Aramaic language or Hebrew language, of the events as they were going around, and those notes would have been passed around. But later on, Matthew writes a gospel, and the gospel itself is written in Greek. The early church believes and, and notes that Matthew wrote his gospel in Hebrew. I think those were just the notes. The gospel itself, most scholars readily recognize the gospel itself was written in Greek. But it also looks pretty clearly like Matthew had Mark's gospel at hand when Matthew was writing. And so Matthew's writing a second gospel. Luke, some people think wrote earlier, some people think Luke's writing later. I think Luke's writing before the death of Paul. And I think that's why you don't read about the end of Paul's time in Rome at the end of Acts, but different scholars fuss that differently. I'm not going to deal with Luke today. Luke's another time. What I'd like to deal with today are Matthew and Mark. So Mark's written first. Mark is written on behalf of Peter. The early church, as early Papias is early 100s AD, is that right, David? About 115 or so. Papias is quoted later by Eusebius, who's a church historian. Papias says that Peter wrote the gospel, or, or dictated, in essence, had Mark write the gospel for him and approved it. Remember, Peter's a fisherman. Peter may not have been that proficient at writing on his own. He may have been, we don't know. But it was very typical to have someone write for you who was really good at writing. And so you could dictate or you could tell. 
And, and Peter told these gospel stories and explained what he wanted and Mark put it into a gospel. And so we've got the gospel of Peter that Mark wrote down. And if you read the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, you're going to see that it's targeted to the larger Gentile world. Peter launched into the Gentile world with the conversion of Cornelius that we read about in Acts. And by the time we get to Paul's letter to the Galatians, we know that Peter's been interacting with people in the Gentile world. Not always in a way that made Paul smile. Church history teaches that Peter went to Rome and, and was the leader of the church in Rome for a period of time before he was uh, crucified under Nero in Rome. Now, Peter then, through Mark, produces this gospel. And when you read the gospel, you understand it's written for that larger Gentile world. Matthew, on the other hand, which I think was written by Matthew, Matthew is targeted to a Jewish readership, more so than the larger Gentile world. Let me tell you how this makes a difference. Um, if we put up here again this, uh, let me say the author of Mark Okay, so we're on Mark that I say is written to the broader Jewish world, I mean Gentile world. The author of Mark knows the geography very well. The author of Mark is not a foreigner to the Judea, to the land of Israel, to the, the people of, of Israel. He's not foreign to that because he certainly knows the geography well. He has no trouble talking about Judea and Jerusalem and the nearby wilderness and puts them all in places where they appropriately are. He writes and knows about Jericho and Bethany and the Mount of Olives and he's got them where they really are. He writes about the Jordan River. He writes about the Sea of Galilee. He writes about the surrounding communities. He writes about Nazareth, Capernaum and other cities. So he knows the author is to my opinion, clearly from that area. But he's writing to Gentile people. He is having to explain Jewish vocabulary when he uses it. He's having to explain Jewish customs at times. Let me give you an example. Here's Mark I mean, Mark 7, verses 11 through 14. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban. Now, I'm, if I'm just reading that to you and you haven't been thinking about it long, I'll bet you you'd say, what's Corban? You pagan. Um, <laughs> that's who he's writing to. He's writing to a bunch of Greek speakers that don't know Jewish culture and language. He says, that is given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. In other words, these are guys who are figuring out how to shortchange taking care of their parents in older age. Instead of doing it right. So the author's got, no, here's another example. Mark 15, 34, at the ninth hour, this is with Jesus on the cross, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me, forsaken me? And he's having to translate the Aramaic for the reader, because the reader is not a typical Jew who's going to speak Aramaic from that area. Mark 7, 2 through 3. They saw that, that some of the disciples ate without, with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And then look what he has to add in parentheses. Because the Pharisees and all the Jews, they don't eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the traditions of the elders. Well, if he's writing it to Jews, he doesn't have to explain that. But he's not writing it to Jews. The Sadducees came to him. They're the ones who say there's no resurrection. Well, he doesn't have to add that if they're Jews. They know who the Sadducees are. That's like me saying the Republicans 
they're the ones that voted for Donald Trump, said da 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 da. You don't need me to tell you that. Actually, not all Republicans voted for Donald Trump. It's a bad example. But you, you get the idea. Mark 3, 17, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom Jesus gave the name Bonerges, that is, sons of thunder. You don't have to translate that unless you're writing to people who don't understand the language. So you see this over and over and over. You'll also see in Mark that the author rarely quotes the Old Testament. A couple of times, Isaiah. That's about it. When you compare it to the others, now I'm not saying you don't use language and allusions and stuff from the Old Testament, but quoting it, very rare. So, there's also in Mark, and I don't think this is in Matthew, Luke, or John, I think only in Mark, you see these unique Latin words, loan words from the Latin language. He just puts them into Greek letters, but they're Latin words. For example, the, the, the man with the many demons in the gatherings, my name is Legion, Legion. Legio is the Latin word for many. My name is Legion. That's not a Greek word. Oh, it's written with Greek letters, but it's just the Latin word put into Greek. He doesn't have to explain that the way he explains Aramaic. How about this passage? Mark 6, 27, the king, this is when uh, John the Baptist has been beheaded. The king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. Maybe an executioner. This is, this Greek word, um, speculator, is the Latin word, speculator, <laughs> which in English would read speculator. But a speculator in this sense is not someone who sits around and says, I wonder what that is. It's uh, someone who like speculates for gold. It, it's a courier. It's someone who goes to get something in the Latin usage. Can be an executioner but also just a courier. So he sends a messenger. He sends FedEx, tells him to go get John's head. Here's another Latin loan word. He talked about how the, the washing of cups and pots, zetes is the Greek word, sextarius is the Latin word. That, those are, that's the Latin word for pots. You won't learn that in Greek class. You'll learn that in Latin class and put it into Greek letters. So you've got here Mark, who's very clearly writing his gospel for the Latin and, and Greek larger non-Jewish world, in the main at least. Now compare that to Matthew. Matthew expects his audience to know Judaism. Matthew's not having to explain it. If you compare Mark 7, 1 through 13 to the companion way that Matthew writes it up in Matthew 15, 1 through 9, I made some reference to the Mark 7 earlier, but let's just remind you what it says. Mark 7. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who'd come from Jerusalem, they saw some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that's unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. Now you compare that to Matthew 15. Matthew writes up the same thing. But look at the way Matthew writes it. Matthew 15. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat. See the difference? This is written for an audience that doesn't understand Jewish practice. So it has to be, in, Mark has to insert 
Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. Matthew knows his people know it and just puts it in there. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? He doesn't have to explain it. It goes on further. You can continue to look, uh, 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 and this is where he's got in Mark the washing of cups and pots. Okay? And, and that's the Latin word. It's missing from the way that this is put down in uh, Matthew. He doesn't do it. It's just not there. You know, if you look at Matthew, look, oh, let's, let's go back to Matthew. Matthew starts out with a genealogy. Look at the genealogy. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham... Abraham was the father of Isaac. Who does Matthew start his genealogy with? Abraham, the father of the Jews. Compare that, for example, to Luke. Luke's genealogy. It's here somewhere. Here we go. Genealogy. Jesus was the son of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Matt. And he goes all the way back to the son of Adam, the son of God. Matthew doesn't do that. Matthew's just taking it back to Abraham because that's all the Jews really cared about. And so he's writing this even with the genealogy. So if we understand that Matthew is writing with a Jewish audience in mind... Now some of the passages in Matthew carry some additional significance to us. And so I'd like to look at a couple of those passages and consider them with you. Let's go through a couple together. Here's Matthew 28, 18 through 19. And if I put Matthew up here, I didn't add verse 20, but if I put up Matthew 28... 18, 19, and 20, which is just the rest of the quotation I didn't have room for. Do you know what comes after that in Matthew? Nothing. That's the end of the book. So Matthew ends his book, and he ends it strong. He doesn't go out with a whimper. But look at the end of Matthew. Jesus came and said to his apostles, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this is a huge deal. You're writing to Jews and you're letting the Jews know that the last thing Jesus said that's put in your book is go to all the nations. This is not a Jewish possession. And every Jew who's reading this should climb out of their Jewish messianic shell and recognize they've got ministry to other people. That God's call is not limited to one race. It's open to everybody. God is calling all humanity back to him. Through the Jews, all of the nations of the world shall be blessed. That was the promise to Abraham. And so to put that in there is huge. Now, we can't just read over this and gloss over it. There is one other thing that's notable here. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do you know what that should remind us of? At the very start of Matthew in chapter 4, Jesus is out in the wilderness being tempted. And do you remember what the temptation had in 4, 8 through 9? This is the tempter. This is the evil one. This is Satan. Satan says to Jesus the following, 4, 8 through 9. He took him to the very high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says, I'll give you all of these if you'll fall down and worship me. Satan was willing to give Jesus second-hand authority under him 
for all the nations of the world. But Jesus says, all authority, heaven and earth, has been given to me. Not just that limited sub-authority under Satan as I bow down to worship him for the kingdoms of this earth, but all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now there are roughly 7.9 billion people on the planet today. And God cares for every single solitary one. Now, I know a number of those 7.9 billion people because I'm looking at them right now. And some are watching this on the internet right now, which could be at any point in time on the internet. But you can put your name there and say, God included me in the people he wanted to hear about his love expressed through Jesus. Jesus said, go to all nations. That includes you. And that includes me. That's the love we have from this God. And it's an amazing love. And it's not based, he didn't say go find out of the 7.9 billion people, go find the good ones. He didn't say go find the nice ones. He's including rascals in this. He's including bad people in this. I can't imagine that Vladimir Putin would watch this video. But if he does, I want to tell you, God loves you. I don't care how bad and wicked and evil you are, there is redemption at the feet of the man who paid the price for all of the wicked things you've done. And I don't know anybody who's going to rank up there much above Paul, who in the name of God is out there killing Christians. Are seeing to their death. But God saves him. Go to all nations. All right, let's look at another passage that's heightened in Matthew if we understand the audience that he's writing to. This is Matthew 22 41 through 45. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? This passage is not going to make sense to a lot of people who aren't, who aren't Jewish. Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. David's a big deal, even still today. I mean, he's still got like one of the nicest hotels in Jerusalem named after him. It's the King David Hotel. The, the, the Israel flag's got the star of David on it. Big deal. So they said, the son of David. The great king of Israel. So Jesus said to him, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now you may look at that and you may say, Okay, I guess that's pretty logical, but I'm not sure what he means. So let's look at what he means. Um, Matthew 22, 41 through 45. Uh, let's see, here it is. He's quoting Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, a Jew would know Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is a psalm 
of David. In Hebrew, it says La David. It could mean it's by David. could mean it's uh, dedicated to David. But, but Jesus indicates that this is expressing David's prophetic vision. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You'll see the first Lord is in all capitals. You see that? That is because it is yod Hey vav Hey. It is the name of God. It's the name that is not to be pronounced. It's the name that God gave to Moses. The name of God, yod Hey vav Hey, Yahweh is the way a lot of people say it who aren't afraid of getting struck by lightning. The Lord says to my Lord... So this Lord's not capitalized. It's referencing a Lord or a, an earthly Lord, if you will, in a sense. Um, so the name of God, God who revealed himself to Moses, says to my Lord. So this is David saying that David's Lord is being spoken to by Moses' God, by the God. So the God says to David's Lord, you sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let me draw it for you. This is David. Okay? You know that because it says it right underneath. All right. So David says the following. David says, God says to my slash David's Lord sit until I make pop, 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 pop. You got it? So this is what Jesus is saying. If David is calling the Messiah his Lord, then how can the Messiah be his son? Now, these are things that make you go, huh. And that's what it did to the smarty pants who had been trying to quiz Jesus. Bunch of lawyers, they're like, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to talk about it anymore. <clears throat> Have a good day. I mean, what are they going to say? They, they can't figure this out. Now, it makes sense to us. It makes sense that David is talking about the son of David, the, the Messiah to come from his lines is not just going to be his son, though. He's going to be much more than just his son. This is the kind of passage that makes sense to the Jews reading it in Matthew where the Gentiles would be struggling. But this also tells you that you get a glimpse through Jesus of the end of the story. That what God had planned from the beginning is finding its expression in Jesus. In Jesus we have the end of the age. We are living in the last days and have been since Jesus. This is the end of the age. Is he coming back today? I don't know. Tomorrow? I don't know. In the year 2525? Not according to the song that was popular in the 60s, but I don't know. I just know he's coming back and we're in the last days. Because we know the end of the story. And it's been clearly manifested and completed in Jesus. All right, I think we've got time for one more we'll throw out there. Matthew 8.10, when Jesus heard this, now this is a, a, a centurion who, who's a pagan. So remember, the Jews are reading this. A pagan Roman soldier, he's a centurion because he's over a hundred, a century, a hundred. Roman soldiers. He comes to Jesus. And he says, I got a servant who's really sick. I need you to heal him. 
Jesus says, okay, I'll come with you. And the centurion says, look, I'm a, I got a hundred guys under me. You don't have to come. All you got to do is say the word. I, I'm not worthy to have you in my house. You don't need to come. You just say the word. I'm a man of authority. I understand authority. And you have the authority. Just, just say the word. Thank you. And Jesus hears this and he marvels. And he said to the people that were following, this is to the people following Jesus, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Now you're a Jew and you're reading this. That's a stinger. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jewish, in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you got Jews who are reading this and it's like, whoa. Time to get serious about our faith. But the model being held up by Jesus is a pagan man? A centurion? A Roman soldier? That's pretty incredible. And if I'm Jewish and I'm reading this as Matthew's written it, and I get a copy in my hands and I see this, I start thinking, well, this is going to change who I love. This is going to change who, who I care about. 7.9 billion people. We need to care about each one of them. We need to care about what's happening in Ukraine. But not only in Ukraine. Because there are people who are suffering in North Korea. There are people who are suffering all over Africa. There are people who are suffering in the Middle East. There are people who are suffering in Houston. And the charge to the church is to love these people. It's to figure out how we can take care of people who are older and who are younger. The church of Jesus Christ needs to be known to the world as the ones who care about 7.9 billion people. And not one more, but not one less. Everybody. With compassion. That might mean letting someone have your seat. That might mean letting someone pull out in front of you. If you have a Jesus bumper sticker on your car. If you don't, you're allowed to drive like a banshee. <laughs> that might mean caring for someone who you wouldn't normally want to care for. Um, yeah, I got time for this. So... I'm reading a, a, a book. It's entitled Messengers. Now, I, I teach a, a seminar each summer and um, to, to lawyers to, to teach them how to try cases. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's a cool thing. I'll, I'll speak for three days during the month of June, and uh, there'll be a 1,000 lawyers there from all over the, the world I get them from all over the world that come in for this. And so I've got to try and give them something to justify them coming in. And I was reading this book, Messengers, because it talks about how people determine credibility in other people. And that's important for a lawyer to know. But some of the studies that went into the book are fascinating to me on a religious level here's one of the studies there were two fellas that decided to do this study and they went out and they did it in uh, one of the big cities I think in California and they got in two different cars one car was a old beat-up junker one car was a really good looking, almost brand new, hot shot, great car. Okay? 
One would have been owned by someone struggling to make do. The other would have been owned by someone who's got more money than they need. And they drove into town and they stopped at stoplights. And they had a little uh, flunky hidden in the back seat down low with a stopwatch and a notepad. And the light would turn green and the car would just sit there and they would time how long until the people behind them started honking. <laughs> huh? I mean, some people get paid to do experiments like this, what can I say? But it was insightful. Do you know why? I think it was almost twice as long that the person would sit behind someone in a nice car before they honked as when they were behind the jalopy. Behind the jalopy, it's almost immediately, eh. But it, that was one of many, many tests that indicate we, in America at least, treat people differently based upon how we perceive them in the pecking order of life. Christians should not be that way. And it's not because we pull everybody down. It's because we lift everybody up. It's not because we should see everyone driving a jalopy. It's because we should see everyone driving a car of great value. Because that's the God we have. The God who has made every human being in his image. And so every human being has value and worth. And we of all people should speak of them that way. So points for home. Where do we go from here? I was at a, uh, a legal war session, for lack of a better way of saying it. It was a, a case that that was going to be, we didn't know at the time, but a decade-long war before we could bring it to conclusion. And there were about 12 of us that were in charge in the United States with fighting this war. And so I called a war council. I, I was uh, fortunate enough to be one of the leaders of the 12. I called a war council, and I called it in Colorado, where we got away from everybody else and all the cell phones and all the appointments, and we spent three days mapping out our plan of attack. So one night, we're at dinner, and there are 12 of us, and these are pretty big-time lawyers, but they're also really good people. And um, over dinner, we were tired of talking about the case because we'd been talking about it all day long, and so over dinner, the question was asked, what's the best concert you ever went to? And I don't remember who went first, but they probably said some, you know, hokey little thing like, um, I don't know, the Eagles. Sorry. Um, I'm sitting there, and I'm having the big debate in my head. I don't know which I'm going to say. I mean, I saw U2 play in Berlin. That's going to be pretty hard to beat. But I saw Bruce Springsteen in his river tour in Nashville. And I saw Jethro Tull when he was in his prime, jumping, Ian Anderson jumping up and down on the stage looking like a crazy man. So I'm sitting here kind of toying back and forth when Paul goes in front of me, Paul Hanley. Paul says, um, hmm, I think for me my best concert experience would be front row of the Beatles at Shea Stadium in 1965. <laughs> We're like, What? You're lying. We get on YouTube, we find a video of the concert, and at one point they pan the audience, and that's Paul Hanley on the front row of the Beatles, Shea Stadium, 1965. Well, it ended that game. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, I, I saw you too. I mean, there's nothing. Nobody's got anything after that. It's like, game over. Okay, Paul, next time you go last. If I ask you what's the coolest thing you ever saw, I don't know what your answer would be, but here's my story. Behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. 
when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. They saw him as the Messiah, as the king. Jews would have needed, would have understood that. Matthew didn't have to point it out. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them, shut up. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do? They said, Lord, let our eyes be open." Jesus, in pity, touches their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Think of how this fun played for a minute. You got two blind guys, that's four eyes. You got Jesus, that's two hands. He's going to touch their eyes. So he's got to go up to the first one first. Touches them. And that fella, for the first thing he sees is the Lord Jesus in that close. Don't you know he was yelling, rejoicing, I can see! And don't you know the other blind fella was unable to see, thinking, I hope he doesn't forget I'm standing here too. <laughs> Wondering, is it going to work for me? As Jesus reaches out and touches his eyes in pity as well, and he can see. And don't you know that everybody who was there went home, and for the rest of their life, at every legal dinner in Colorado they ever ate at, they said, I don't know about the best concert, but let me tell you about when I saw Jesus heal these two blind guys. He touched their eyes. This is the most incredible thing you've ever seen in your life. And here's the rub. Those people who were able to say that, were the ones who were telling these guys, shut up, be quiet, leave Jesus alone. If they'd had their way, they'd have never seen diddly squat. But Jesus did it anyway. And I read that and I start thinking, how many things am I going to miss out on from God because of my own stupidity and failure to ask and follow and failure to have compassion. See, Jesus was moved with pity, moved with compassion for these two outcasts that everybody else said, you're not in the crowd, just be quiet. And they, the crowd should have been moved with pity. They should have been bringing those fellows up to the front. I read this story and I get scared of where I am in it. All right. We got to wrap this up. Here it is. God loves me, and he, you can say that. I can say God loves you, but I'm personalizing it. God loves me, and you can say that too. Because God loves you. And I want to be watching God at work, and I want to be working with him. Because I don't want to miss this. It's the greatest thing that will ever happen in my life see God at work I want to be in there I want to be in I want to be in there I want to tell it I want to see it and I want to talk about it all right let me bless you in the name of Jesus father in the name of Jesus I ask your blessing on all who hear this message those here those who hear it far and wide move us in pity Lord for those who need your message for those who need your healing touch for those who need Jesus the Messiah the son of David the Lord, the authority of heaven and earth, through whom we pray an amen. Amen.